If only we could see through the water as we do through air, we could know what hazards lurk below. Rocks, debris, and unknown perils make navigation of our waterways treacherous. And slow down the to avoid a shipwreck, we need accurate nautical charts. But to make an accurate chart takes an exacting combination of efforts. Teams must gather a huge amount of data about tides and currents, latitude and longitude, contours of the coastline, and the shape of the sea floor. The better the data, the more precise the chart. Today's surveyors use cutting-edge technology to take their measurements. But 200 years ago, it all began with a simple lead weight at the end of a line. In 1807, the movement of goods and people depended on the sea. There were no railroads, no interstate highways. Ships were key to our economic survival, and the survival of the ship depended on knowing the hazards of each harbor and the nuances of the coastlines, tides, and currents. In 1807, President Thomas Jefferson recognized the need for a survey that would serve the interests of a fledgling nation. At the time, few charts existed of our coastal waters, and the ones that did were very rough and out of date. Jefferson, a surveyor himself, knew that accurate charts would reduce shipwrecks and provide a foundation for the expansion of commerce. Congress agreed with Jefferson and on February 10, 1807, passed the act authorizing what was then called the Survey of the Coast. A grand total of $50,000 was allocated for the task. Several scientists vied for the position of starting the survey. But Ferdinand R. Hassler, an accomplished Swiss scientist and mathematician, earned the honor. Those who knew Hassler called him eccentric, highly sensitive, and absent-minded. A man who made bread at home and came to his laboratory with flour on his coat. Hassler was a stickler for details and emphatic about scientific accuracy. He insisted on the finest surveying tools, which at the time were available only in Europe. He set sail for England in 1811, but the War of 1812 intervened and Hassler was detained abroad as an enemy alien. Four years later, in 1816, Hassler finally returned to the United States and got to work. He began on Fire Island, just outside of New York Harbor. Hassler's first step was to establish what is called a baseline. A baseline is a line between two permanently marked points. As its name implies, the baseline is the starting point for all other parts of the chart. Hassler's baseline method was so exact that he used a microscope and a strand of spider's silk to verify that the iron bars were aligned perfectly. For the baseline, Hassler moved the survey bar 1,800 times over the course of 45 days to measure a total length of exactly 8.73 miles. But setting the baseline was just the first step. Reference stations like lighthouses were established on land. Then the shoreline was mapped. Multiple water level measurements were recorded to establish time and heights of high and low tides. Finally, the sounding party could begin to do their work, running lines, measuring depths, and fixing the launch's positions at regular intervals. Ready? Mark. Twenty-three point five. Twenty-three point five. I. 
Sand. Sand, I. Numbers on the final chart are adjusted to show depths at mean low tide. The work was repetitive, yet utterly thorough. Hassler's diligence was rewarded when one of his surveyors named Getney found a new deep water channel into New York's port. Hassler spent nearly 20 years completing the chart of New York Harbor, the survey of the coast's first published chart. He died just before its publication in 1845. But his legacy was enormous. Hassler had set the surveying bar at its highest scientific level. As a result, United States nautical charts became some of the best in the world.